In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are happy to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you and God for our defeat. God, we have done, and by God, we have done to none. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us. mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister in the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Sovereign God, you turn your greatness into goodness for all the peoples on earth. Shape us into your willing servants of your kingdom and make us desire always and only your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Welcome to Augsburg, and we give thanks for your presence here today. And if you're visiting with us, a special welcome to you. And please let us know how we can walk with you on your faith journey. All of the announcements that I want to share with you today are rooted in a sense of appreciation for your generosity and sharing God's abundance and to be aware of how those needs continue. So first off, last week that I mentioned that our overflow shelter season will kick off on December 1st. But unlike seasons past, there are fewer shelters here in the community serving that need. And so Augsburg is one of two this year instead of one of four, which means volunteers who have been at other shelter sites will certainly want to share in the work that we do here this year. So to that end, a reminder that we've had a week now where we've been able to sign up here for Augsburg shelter dates for meals or for volunteer roles that might work for you or have a special significant date. And we have until tomorrow morning when the sign-up list will be released to the whole community for them to share in as well. And so if you're interested in serving a meal on a special date to you or volunteering on a particular night of the week, I would encourage you this afternoon or this evening to fill that out so that you're able to claim those times. And if you have any questions about that process, Pastor Katie, our Emerging Ministries Coordinator, is here in the back and happy to answer those. Then also this past week, we learned of a need for our generosity in terms of our partnership with the Christ Beloved Community Food Pantry. They were um, not able to receive an order from the government, but still have people coming to collect food. And so they reached out to their church partners to provide for those staples that are usually provided through that government gift. And so in that, we have volunteered as Augsburg to be the rice and beans folks for this next uh, adventure here. That you probably saw this morning on your way in is red beans and rice that are collected on carts both out in the narthex and at the office door. And what a wonderful response that you all have already provided, but we will need that response to continue. So if you're shopping this afternoon or about town, you can drop those off this evening during our evening activities and we'll get those placed for you or bring them by the church tomorrow. And even if you miss that immediate deadline that CBC has, we're always happy to pass along the food gifts that you share. And finally, we're grateful for your generosity in this stewardship season that we share in here at church. Last Sunday was Commitment Sunday, and on behalf of your leadership, I wish to thank you for your abundant and generous response to those who've already turned in Statement of Intent cards. We are on our way to being able to do the work of God in the year to come, but we still need those who have not yet shared their Statement of Intent to do so as soon as possible as our council meets this Thursday evening to prepare next year's budget. So two options in the back, there are more statement of intent cards if you wanna grab one of those and fill that out and put it in the offering basket today. And also a reminder that you can pick up one of these sheets out in the narthex that has simply a QR code on it. And by scanning that, it takes you directly to our online giving portal and you're able to do everything on there. Catherine and I gave online this year and it was so easy that I was grateful for those who've made that possible. So lots of ways to share in generosity this week. We're grateful for all of that. And in the midst of all of that, God's work continues here at Augsburg. I invite you to look at all of the ways that we are busy this week in the announcements in the back of your bulletin. Our service continues now as we hear God's word. A reading from Isaiah. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. 
by a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the witch, rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Hebrews. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward since he himself is subject to weakness and because of this he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. Holy God. 
Gospel according to Mark. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, They began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Eighteen years ago, I was ordained to a call of word and sacrament. And over those years, I have come to get to know the three-year cycle of the revised common lectionary pretty well. So this past June, as my ordination anniversary coincided with our return to worship here in physical community, I made a challenge or a pledge to myself that as I entered my sixth time preaching these texts that I would seek to dig deeper into these texts each week. I wanted to approach these texts from a different angle than I had the five times prior. You see, preachers tend to find a, a path that works and every three years do it again and again and again, and I wanted to be certain not to do that. And so with that in mind, as I looked to these texts for this week, I sought to find a deeper explanation of this conversation that Jesus has with James and John. At first glance, our gospel seems like a squabble between the two brothers, their fellow disciples, and Jesus. At face value, James and John want to have a place of prominence, a favored status. But as I spent time thinking about this in a different way, I came to find that these two were not simply looking for a promotion. What they were looking for was power. They want Jesus to do what they tell him to do. Think about that for a moment. They want Jesus to do what they tell him to do, and they want Jesus to grant places of honor that not only put them at the head table at the right and the left, but give them authority. James and John have been journeying with Jesus long enough that they are trying to parlay their discipleship status into something that even gives them a bigger individual status. In essence, they want to ride Jesus' coattails, or should we say robe tails, to having the same level of power and admiration that Jesus commands everywhere that he goes. Of course, the danger in this whole thought process is easy to understand. By seeking that level of authority and power, the brothers no longer have a need for Jesus' preaching and teaching. They have what they want. And so when we look at this text in that way, It'd be all right to ponder and to understand as a good lesson if this was simply a story told in the Gospel of Mark. 
But what James and John do in this text has been repeated time and time again for the last two millennia. How often have we encountered throughout Christian history those who have used their Christian status to exert authority over others? Rulers of all types, kings and queens, dictators and heads of state have all used their Christian authority over others, and the great ones are tyrants over them. The aristocracy, the bourgeoisie, landowners and masters, and all types of titans of industry have found ways to make money and advance their livelihood on the backs of others with that same Christian authority. And of course, the church, as an institution, as the denominations within it, and unfortunately times many priests, pastors, and others in positions of ecclesiastical power have used their Christian authority in less than grace-filled ways. Just like James and John, there have been countless individuals, institutions, and empires that have used their connections to Christ to exert authority and their whims over others. And one of the most effective in doing so is not simply by exerting their power and claiming their status, but also by creating a state of suffering for their subjects below them. Today's first lesson from Isaiah is part of the familiar servant song. We hear this particular passage that Pastor Laurie read just a moment ago in a longer form every Good Friday as we make the connection between the suffering that Jesus undergoes for us on the cross with the poetic words of the suffering servant in Isaiah. Now, as we know, Isaiah was written during the Babylonian exile long before Jesus was ever incarnate and present physically here on earth. And to this day, biblical scholars continue to debate whether or not there was a single individual who this text was referred to or whether this servant was simply an analogy for the whole people of Israel who suffered throughout the exile. But regardless of that Old Testament debate, there were many in post-New Testament times who found conniving ways in their authority to subject others to great suffering. And as I read commentaries on this passage from Isaiah this week, I was somewhat overwhelmed and frankly ashamed to discover how many times throughout the last 2,000 years that those who have used their Christian authority to force their subjects to suffer. The scripture text has been used over the last 2,000 years to condone crusades and inquisitions that took young men away from their homes to fight in wars that often had little value. The scripture text has been used to allow the slave trade to flourish here in the colonies and throughout the Americas. This text has been used to force conversions of communities throughout the First Nations indigenous persons and in other communities. And this text has been used to perpetuate the anti-Semitism that existed in Luther's time and in more recent times. By suggesting to those who were under their authority, whichever tyrant we speak of in governance or business or in the church, that to please God, others should subject themselves and undergo great suffering is part of scripture and that that is their lot. And to think in that way is a way that I'm sure any of us would be uncomfortable with. To suggest that to truly be faithful that they should suffer at the hands of others. Now, James and John might not have been thinking about it. They might have simply wanted to benefit from Jesus' glory in their own circumstance. But in the other centuries that have followed, many others have done so at great cost. And I think it's important that as we reflect upon history and think of the ways that authorities have used Scripture to force suffering of those under them, that we need to remember that that is not simply a matter of historical record. There are still numerous examples of those who have been drawn away from their homes for the exploits of others. That there are still those who are human trafficked today 
and often groomed into whatever circumstances they might be facing and told that it's part of their religious responsibility. That conversions of others still happen in ways that we might be unaware of and certainly uncomfortable with. And that, yes, anti-Semitism still exists today. There are many who suffer, and many who suffer because God's word has been used wrongly. And it is for those people, those who suffer, for who Jesus was sent into the world. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. It is for those who are exploited, those who are enslaved and trafficked, those who are taken away from the lives that they long for, that Jesus came into this world. God sent Jesus into the world so that he could pay the price, the ransom for those who have been the victims of sin and brokenness of the world we live in. God sent Jesus into the world to remind those who are suffering in this daily life that indeed there is something better, that the promise is made known through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ would lead to all of those who this world has made last be the ones who are first. Now here's the thing. I know that almost everyone who hears this today knows this. They hear this preaching and it's obvious that we don't want people to suffer and we would certainly not want to be the ones who cause the suffering. We know that Jesus came into this world to live among us and then rise from the dead for all who are marginalized, all of those who are suffering in any way. But we have to be careful as followers of Jesus that we are not quick to simply say, well, Jesus paid that ransom for all who suffer. Let them rest in that hope, and we'll go back to living our daily lives. No, we are called to do more than that. As Christians, as disciples of Jesus, we are not called to suffer. Rather, we are called to stand with those who suffer. We are called to be the voice for those who have been oppressed, exploited, and taken advantage of. We are called to recognize our privileges, the authority that we have in our own lives, and to use that care for those who are suffering in any way. Suffering is all around us. We don't have to look far to find it. But when we do, We can't ignore it. Now, usually at this point in the sermon, I would give a few examples or maybe even mention a few of our mission partners and how we can help those who suffer. But today I want to be careful to not limit our vision of the suffering to only those that we know that exist in the world around us. Rather, suffering is everywhere. And suffering takes place in ways that if we were to see it, we would recognize it clearly. For we know what is right and wrong. We know what is a healthy way to live and what is an unhealthy way to live. And we often see that there are perpetrators who cause suffering on others. And so taking off our blinders and knowing that there is suffering in the world around us, I would ask this week that as you return to your daily lives, that you challenge yourself with these three questions. Are you shining the Christ light on the darkness around you? Are you holding out your hand to those who reach for help? Are you speaking and advocating a word of peace that so many long to hear? Are you standing with the suffering? Or are you just like James and John? Amen.
Living together in trust and hope, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Set free from sin and death and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all God's creation. Holy One, for the gift of the church handed down through the ages and for all who carry on the servant ministry of Jesus, we praise you. Send your Holy Spirit upon all who are discerning calls to ministry in its many forms and equip them with your gifts. Lord, in your mercy, creating one for the lush and abundant habitat you provide for all your creatures, we praise you. Provide healing for the earth so that all living things flourish as you intend. Lord, in your mercy. Suffering one, for all who work toward peace and who lead nations with a servant's heart, we praise you. Bring justice for all who suffer violence, persecution, discrimination, hunger, poverty, and homelessness, and create places of refuge for all people. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful one, for all who do the work of healing in mind, body, and spirit, we praise you. Surround and comfort all who struggle with depression, anxiety, cancer, diabetes, dementia, or any illness, that all may be healed. Today we lift up Maurice Evans, Lee McCusick, Marcia Smith, Peg Keller, the Michael Robinson family, Jessica Holmes, Jay Wise, Eula Mae Hutchins, Mamie Cox, Bob Milner, Dan Moore, Hank Farrar, John Paolo Pasquinelli, Susan Cherwin, the Robinson family, the McLaurin family, Kathy Olson, and all those we lift up on our lips and in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Sustaining one, for all who volunteer for the vitality of this congregation, we praise you. Strengthen and encourage greeters, ushers, office volunteers, counters, committee and ministry team leaders, teachers, students, evangelists, singers, builders, nurturers, and all who serve with generous hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Risen one, we thank you for those who have shaped your church and shared your gospel. Through the witness of your saints, continue to inspire us with hope until we are all gathered at your eternal feast. We remember Robert Williams, Dave Montgomery, Patricia Doran, Glenn Blackman, Chuck Romagnoli, Pete Smith, Gary Nelson, Elizabeth Coffey, Rick Inman, Emerson Patasol, William Raynard Chavis Miller, Jr., Rita Toivinen, Barbara Wise, Audrey Grimm, Violet Fowler, Helen DeLuper, Paul Whitman, Barbara Schwartz, Virginia Fries, Mike Cahill, Lord, in your mercy. 
confident that you hear us, O oh God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please remain standing. Merciful God, you are most holy and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. At the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all the drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-given passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, Lord, O God Almighty, not as we are ought, but as we are able. 
And we ask you to mercifully accept our praise and thanksgiving and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace and receiving the forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. When we eat of this bread, we share the body of Christ. When we drink from this cup, we share the blood of Christ. We give you thanks, Almighty God, 
that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another, for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with mercy and give you peace.